there are a number of families that have a very difficult time um, feeding their baby. It's a slow process. The baby doesn't suck and swallow well. The baby doesn't adapt to certain nipples or to the breast very well. Um, and uh, so we, we see some families who struggle the first few weeks, maybe as long as six weeks, with feeding. And um, parents will tell me that they pull every nipple off the shelf and they try something new until something clicks and it works. Um, we're not entirely sure that that's a phenomenon of a large tongue. It, it may be that the large tongue contributes to that. It may be that it's more of a phenomenon of that baby and the other things that that baby brings with them into life. Breathing is one of those things. Um, many people are concerned about the airway in the newborn infant. And certainly, if a large tongue um, is also occluding the throat in the back, we, we see the tongue out front. So we think of the tongue as being forward. And probably forward is a good thing because the baby will be able to breathe well if the tongue is forward. But if the tongue at the back is sitting in the throat, it's blocking the airway. And um, that can lead to all kinds of respiratory problems, but we would think um, of obstructive sleep apnea as being um, a big concern early on. Um, my colleague here at Children's Hospital, Dr. David Mulder, is the otolaryngologist who participates with the Beckwith Wiedemann Research Registry, and that's really his area of expertise. Um, and he will be, I'm sure, the first to note that um, when there are breathing problems in a, in a child with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, um, it's, it's very important to look beyond the tongue as a cause because it's entirely possible, again, that the baby has brought with them into life other things than just the large tongue. Um, things like tracheal stenosis or tracheal laryngomalacia, there are, there are other things that can be associated with respiratory problems, and all of those have to be ruled out before you blame the tongue immediately. One of the difficulties with that really large tongue is that that's what we all see. And for the care provider who's not, um, who's not familiar with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome or has never seen a baby with an enlarged tongue before, um, I think it can be easy to panic and go, oh my goodness, a large tongue. We're going to have speech and feeding and breathing problems. And um, fortunately, uh, the children with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome have taught us that that's not necessarily the case, and we need to look for other things. One of the things that we've learned in through the registry and through the years working with the craniofacial team is that um, probably more than half, right now it's looking like about, well, a little over 60% actually of children with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome will never need speech therapy, whether or not they have their tongue reduced. Um, the neurologically intact baby seems to do just fine with a big tongue, and that's true for feeding as well as for speech. Um, tongue reduction surgery, we have learned, will not cure a speech problem that requires speech therapy. It will not cure a feeding problem that requires feeding therapy. Um, it doesn't seem to have an effect of preventing a speech or a feeding problem. Um, the children who seem to need speech or feeding therapy bring with them into life other risk factors which will predispose them to a speech or a feeding problem. The most common of those risk factors is prematurity. Um, in, in my database, about half of the individuals with BWS that I've evaluated were born prematurely. Some of them as early as 26 weeks, um, estimated gestational age. 
the pre preemie baby population in general is, is much more prone to speech and language pro development problems, to, to feeding problems. Here at St. Louis Children's Hospital, we have two full-time speech pathologists just in our neonatal intensive care unit um, taking care of feeding issues with premature babies. Premature babies are referred to early intervention programs for early monitoring because we know they're at risk for speech and language problems. And in fact, prematurity is the most commonly associated risk factor in the BWS population of children who end up requiring speech or feeding therapy or both. Um, so there are many children with BWS who never need me, and that's great.